Hello, students of Johnson University's uh, The Theology of the Trinity. Uh, this is your lecturer and instructor, Dr. David Russell Mosley. Uh, these follow up lectures are something I used to do a lot more when Johnson was the only job that I had. Now that I have a full time job, it's harder for me to really get around to making um, follow up videos just to kind of comment on things that I see. But uh, especially since I didn't get a chance to comment on everyone's Gregory uh, of Nazianzus forum posts, I wanted to make just a quick video to respond to two things that I saw coming up in your discussion posts. So the first, and this is the one that I saw the most of, and I apologize for the clanging, that's the radiators in my classroom here. Uh, the first that I noticed uh, was an issue with, uh, so you all notice that Gregory is trying to say, that God does not create the Holy Spirit and the Son. They are not creations, that they are God. And yet at the same time, he sources their existence in God the Father. And some of you are like, it sounds like he's saying that they're not creations, and then when he explains what they are, they sound like creations. Uh, but what Gregory is saying here is something that the church has traditionally taught for the last 2,000 years. That is, that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. This is a mistake I see a lot of people make. A lot of people think that the begottenness of the Son only relates to the Incarnation. But it doesn't. It relates to the eternal nature of the second person of the Trinity. Right? Think of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's this notion of word, something that is spoken forth, but something that can also be thought, becomes very central in uh, Trinitarian theology. And you're going to see that this week in particular uh, and in the next two weeks with Augustine and Aquinas. Uh, so this is not uncommon. This is not unusual to describe it this way. And depending on who you read, the Holy Spirit's relationship is different yet again. For Gregory... The Holy Spirit is um, is a procession from the Father. Uh, that is, think of the if if you've ever said the Nicene uh, Creed, you will know that it says that the uh, and I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Now, in Greek churches, that's where the creed ends. In uh, Latin influenced churches, that is, in Roman influenced churches, so that's everyone who's not uh, some kind of Eastern Orthodox. It's from the Father and the Son. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but I simply want to bring up that this is something that has been believed and taught almost from the very beginning, that the relationship between the Father and the Son is that of a Father and a Son, not biologically, but in a higher, grander way that actually informs our understanding of fatherhood and of sonhood or sonship, okay? And the spirit is is similar. The spirit proceeds. It's, it's the breath. Um, Augustine's going to equate it with the will of God. Right? Augustine and Aquinas will also both talk about the spirit being the love between the father and the son. And again, you'll see that this week, or you've already seen that this week if you're um, up on the reading and everything. So just, uh, this is not unusual, the idea that the Son and the Spirit find their origin in God is not unusual. Right? According to Gregory, and again, pretty much every um, small o Orthodox Trinitarian theologian from this point on, uh, the Father, they're all eternal. They're all co-equal, co-powerful. They're all 100% God. But... The Father is the only one who is unoriginate. And the Spirit is the only one who proceeds only. And the Son is the only one whose procession can be described as being begotten. And so hopefully that helps clear that up a little bit. The other thing that came up, and this came up in the questions forum as well as in one of your posts, was the question of, does God have a body? Uh, now, one of you, I think it was Shannon, maybe, 
collected a lot of scriptural passages that would seem to indicate that God has a body, right? God shows his back to Moses. He stretches out with his right hand. Christ is seated at his right hand. Uh, Isaiah sees him seated on a throne. Um, all of these things, right? So these passages would read, um, literally would seem to indicate that God does have a body. And in fact, uh, if you read my reply to Shannon, I think it was Shannon. If it wasn't, if Shannon, if this wasn't you, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. Uh, but if you saw my response to that, I also noted that uh, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, God is described as having a long nose. And the reason God is described as having a long nose is because the Hebrew idiom for um, becoming angry is that your nose becomes hot. And so since God is long-suffering or is slow to anger, his nose must be very long. We're talking, you know, Cyrano de Bergerac here. Uh, because it takes it a long time to get hot. And that right there, I think, gives us the key for understanding these other passages. It's not that God has a body. It's not that he has a right hand to sit at. It's that sitting at a king's right hand means that you are his right hand man. That is, you are the second in command. You are the second most important person. Right? When it talks about God's mighty arms, it's not to say that God has arms. It's to say that God is powerful. When it talks about even Moses not being able to see the face of God, but seeing his back, there, uh, I don't think we're supposed to read that literally. What we're supposed to understand is that Moses had to see a veiled version of God, that Moses couldn't see God in his complete unveiled divinity, because if he did, he would die. Right? That's the important thing. And the other key, I think, for understanding that this is the way we're supposed to read those bodies, besides passages, which say things like, God is a spirit, is that God is described in many ways. God is said to be a rock. God is said to be like a, a mother hen who broods over her chicks. God has wings in some descriptions. God uh, has a womb in some descriptions. So if we're going to say that God has a body, then that body has a womb. Because God is moved in his womb. He is moved sometimes also in his bowels. So that would imply that God has bowels. So, and, and it's so important to understand that no Jew or Christian has understood any of those passages to mean that God has a body. That's something that comes much later. It's when pagans start becoming Christians that they start thinking, oh, maybe God has a body. In fact, Mormons will often go to people like Origen of Alexandria or Augustine uh, because both of those men, are, as well as Gregory, argue against those who try to claim that God does have a body. Uh, and so they, Mormons try to use those passages to say, see, look, there were people who called themselves Christians who said God had a body. And this is true. But Origen and Augustine and Gregory and everyone else says that they're wrong. Now, I suppose in, in one sense, just because this is what's always been taught doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. But it does mean that the burden of proof is on those who want to say that, no, the way everyone's been reading these texts and the way people who were alive much closer to the time that these texts were written were reading those texts has been reading them wrong. And I have the secret knowledge that teaches me how to read them correctly. Or maybe not the secret, but just the superior knowledge that allows me to read them correctly. So... Does God have a body? I'm fully with Gregory of Nazianzus. No. And if you want to bring up Jesus, yeah, sure. In his human nature, God has a body. But not in his divine nature. Insofar as we can separate, that is, we can distinguish between the divine nature and the human nature, God, in his divine nature, doesn't have a body. But God in his human nature, because now God does have a human nature, thanks to the second person of the Trinity. God does have a body. Okay? So hopefully that's as clear as mud. Uh, I'm going to post this to YouTube, and then uh, I will 
send an email with a link to it. Uh, you, I used to post them all to Sakai. I find that very time consuming. It's usually much quicker to just post it to YouTube and send you all links so that you can choose to watch it or not. I hope that you did. Uh, <laughs> as I say this to the camera, where if you didn't watch it, I, you don't know that I said this. But anyway, I hope that this helped uh, make a little bit more sense out of Gregory and what he was saying. God bless, and I will see you next time.